recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on, on Horses. Horses. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Friends on Horses. We're here with Shelby Sword, hope, hopefully, or Sword. Hopefully I said that right. You can correct me, Shelby. <laughs> um, Sword, yeah. Sword, perfect. Um, and I met Shelby at a first aid instructor course. Um, that I was lucky enough to go to that was up in the mountains with um, a whole bunch of badass hunting horse people. Uh, and <laughs> I kind of was like, oh my God, we need to talk to this lady because she's doing something so cool. Um, Shelby, do you wanna just kind of say where you work, what you do and um, why I think you're so cool? Well, I already said why I think you're cool, but go on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So. Um, so for kind of for a job, what we, me and my husband do is we basically run our, his parents outfitting territory. So it's called White Swan Lake Outfitters. And it's kind of right in the East Kootenays of British Columbia. And it's got a huge portion of land. I think it's like 2000 square miles of basically leased property that we're allowed to guide non-resident hunters on. So it's a pretty cool gig that not a lot of people have access to. And we live out here full time and are the caretakers and the runners of the facility. So it's about 40 minutes off the highway and about two hours from town. So it's definitely an interesting way of life. It's pretty, it was pretty awesome being out there, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, Mary and I wanted to interview someone like you for a while. Um, so lucky us that we get to do that today. And and a badass woman too, which is a bonus, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did you get into this? Like, how did this all start for you? Well, it was pretty convenient. I kind of just married my husband and <laughs> got thrown in. <laughs> But I always wanted to do something with horses and run my own business anyways. So it kind of just worked out. It was just exactly where I wanted to be. And that's all he wanted to do with his family life. And so we just kind of took it over from their parents. And they're going to retire here soon. So we'll be running it full time. And it worked out. It was just a super convenient thing. And it sounds like it's quite a unique operation in that you do incorporate horses into your um, expeditions. What does that look like? Like how many horses do you have up there? Um, what does the kind of setup look like and how do you incorporate that in these big hunting adventures? Uh, it's pretty good. We got um, 20 horses or so and it kind of rotates every year depending if what new ones we get or old retirees we lose. Um, Right now, we actually just transferred them over to our winter pasture because we do not have power to keep them and their water thawed all winter. But it's pretty cool. So we, most of the time, like we don't do a lot of direct like shooting or anything off horseback because that is, um, it can be dangerous and we want to keep things as safe as we can for clients. So a lot of it's like they're more of like our little assistants in the hunting world. So we'll take the horses on like big pack trips because we have several cabins and like the big pack trip can be like as long as 10 hours out into the bush and they carry our food for us and all our gear for us and then if we have a successful harvest they'll end up carrying the animal out of the bush for us as well so we're very reliant on them they're kind of like our lifelines out there but yeah it's definitely you got to have some good horses and it's pretty cool to be able to depend on them like that yeah what um what kind of things do the horses so the horses probably carry um well all of your food and your camping supplies if you need it and your emergency supplies and um yeah. and your animals out like do they pack animals out too yeah yeah they sure do which sometimes gets a little interesting, but most of the time they're really good. You've got, of course, everyone's seen like the pack boxes. So you've got those big plastic pack boxes, 
So you'll take the animal and you'll quarter it all up and cut it up and you stick it in the pack box. So they don't really know the difference, but yeah, they carry everything out for you. And like we have horses of all shapes and sizes. Like we have some very large Percheron Fjord quarter horse, uh, like cross horses. And they're about, I don't know, I'd say they're about 1600 pound animals. So they carry probably max, you'll load them up to about 200 pounds on each side, which is mainly if you have like an animal harvest or something like that and you're trying to get the animal out in one trip but yeah it's definitely like they get loaded up pretty good sometimes they look pretty funny coming out of the bush all packed up <laughs> I bet. And how do um, the horses come to be with you do you have a breeding program that's specific to your outfit or do you go and select horses um, when we got the territory, so hit, Cody's parents picked it up nine years ago. They purchased it. It came with a lot of the horses already, okay. which is convenient because okay. they already know the job and we get the horses with the territory. They know the trails. So we all know how horses are with trails. They'll take you there and take you back. Like you don't need to know where you're going. Um, and then kind of mainly my job is to find more holts that we can incorporate into it so like I'll kind of always keep my eye open for like kind of cheaper like large good boned colts that we can take and we train in the summer and then if they're going to be a good pack horse we keep them for the string and if they're show more potential and I can make more money off of them I sell them as like a performance horse or something. Hmm. And is it mostly you that does the training or um, your husband or is it a joint affair? It's definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> My husband would operate with quads if he could. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you came to this with, a, with some horse experience and um, kind of a love for horses. Um, when did that start for you? Oh, I've had horses all my life. I've just as a child I was kind of more of like a weekend warrior just trail riding with my mom but as I grew up I started getting more and more interest so I just decided to go all out and I went to Ec Olds College for my equine science program and I did my diploma there and I specialized in western horsemanship and I did a lot of the training programs there for like the Greenbroke horses and while I was there, I started my own colt and I took her to school with me. So I rode her in school and I definitely learned a lot. It was like a clinic every single day for two years. Wow, fun. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and how, how many, okay, so I, I want to paint a picture for people because I've seen you on Facebook and Instagram um, and what one of these expeditions might look like. But other people who yeah. say never hunted or or they've, you know, mostly spent their time in an arena might not know. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so what does it look like when you've got a string of horses? How many are, are you using? And um, um, how do they all stay together? And what kind of um, ground are they, do they have to navigate through? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's, we'll go back and we'll kind of do like a rehearse of events for my pack trip we did last fall before COVID. <laughs> so we had a bow hunter come in for early bow hunting season for elk. And so the day before you leave, you got to make sure you go and catch all the horses off the grazing lease, which is normally a rodeo and a half, because we got typically you'll have about 15 horses on a grazing lease depending on which one you're going to so we are grabbing all those horses and it's they're definitely not the eager work horses they know when you're coming to get them they're <laughs> going to work and they're going to work hard so sometimes it can be quite exciting and you're out there all day chasing horses on a pasture with no fences so I think we spent it was like six hours before we finally caught one horse, which happened to be our mule, Penny, which you met. I, I got to so, ride Penny. <laughs> yeah, Penny's pretty cool. <laughs> so we ended up catching her, and to actually catch the other horses, we had to hop on her and ride her and crash into the leader, like a T-bone crash into the leader to make him stop, which is just a rodeo. 
Like we, nothing ever goes how you plan it, <laughs> which is just lovely. Um, so luckily he's a good, good old boy though, and he just stops after. Says we have no roping skills, which would probably be a good thing to learn one day. <laughs> <laughs> so once you catch him, we finally got him, and then the rest of the herd's easy as soon as you catch him. Stinker. <laughs> um got him got him into the pen for the night and it's like it's dark at this point and we don't have a horse trailer for 15 horses so you have to tail tie them all to each other so you take your halter and you tail tie it to just a small portion of their tail so that if they do decide to do anything it just pulls out a small portion of their tail and it doesn't actually cause any damage so we have 15 horses tail tied to each other while I sit on the tailgate of my husband's truck and he drives about 10 kilometers an hour <laughs> until we can get them to the main cabin in the pasture. <laughs> so you're sitting there for probably another hour and they're all walking or trotting behind you. And wow. it's definitely, it's pretty cool. You get some pretty cool photos and videos of like all the horses running behind you. It's definitely exciting. So that's always your first shocker of coming into the outfitting world is catching those horses. Uh, are they, they make are they you appreciate your performance for us. Are they used hmm? to being like how 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 well do they adapt to being tail tied? Um they figure it out pretty quick, definitely. Like once you, you teach the horse how to tie up first, obviously. And once they figure out how to tie up and the pressure on the halter, they're great. Like you take your colts, you tie them to the good ones, and the good ones never kick. And they just, they, they're following a horse and they're following the pressure on the halter, so they're pretty good at it. It's definitely when you take a colt that's never been tail tied to before and you tie one of the horses up to him, that's where you might have a bit more excitement. <laughs> so we just tie those ones up at the back <laughs> and prolong that. <laughs> Wait for them to get a little more used to it before we go and try to do that wow. we wait until they're quite a bit older like we probably wouldn't tail tie a horse until he's at least like eight years old and we've had him for like three years of solid outfitting because it could turn pretty quick mm -hmm. I bet. yeah yeah so then once you got the horses the first thing the next day when you're getting ready to go so you're gonna leave that day is you're up probably at about, so it was the beginning of summer, December, so I think we were up at a four in the morning, because it's a 10-hour ride, like straight riding, not saddling, not unsaddling or anything, it's 10 hours straight riding into your back cabin where you want to be that night, because it sucks having to stay in the middle of the trail with all those horses and no tents. So four in the morning, you're up, you quickly eat breakfast, and you go out and you catch all the horses again <laughs> and you start packing them up and it's just like you're in the dark you've got a flashlight on your head you have them all tied up and you're putting pack saddles on them and of course because they all know they're going to work they're all jacking around a little bit because it's brisk in the morning it's kind of that fall morning where things are still a little frosty so you got you definitely always have one or two horses that's going to pull back and do something when you're trying to put the pack saddles on them. So your hunter's always just kind of sitting there shell-shocked. <laughs> He's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so it's definitely interesting, but it's so funny because they always get so goofy. We all know horses, cold mornings, they always get so goofy. And then as soon as you get them all done and it's about probably six or seven in the morning, you're just Finally, everyone, you've got ponying people, you've got tail tied to other ones, you're on your own saddle horses. It's funny, they just are smart again. They're calm, they're ready to behave, and they're like a good old trail plug again where you don't have to worry about anything. And so then you leave the cabin. Sorry? I was just going to say, and you've terrified your, your uh, arrogant riders <laughs> after that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We call them Kuyu Cowboys up here. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like the huge hunting brand and they always come decked out in hunting brands and then they bring like their nice Stetson cowboy hat they bought just for the trip. And we're like, oh yeah. 
Right, and their cowboy hat has no dirt on it whatsoever. This, yeah. yeah, typically white, always yeah. a white hat. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you go and you head over on the trail, and for the most part, like the first beginning, probably the first three hours of the trail is like a lot of road riding because it goes into a um, park, so we can't take any vehicles into it, so you're just a lot of riding on the road. It's pretty easy. You're, the hunter's like, oh yeah, I got this. And then of course you finally get off the road onto the trail. And that's where like the terrain gets pretty intense. Like I definitely wouldn't want to take a small bone, like even like a little cutting quarter horse. Like I wouldn't want to take them on some of that stuff because there's portions of rock that are like shale and like sometimes they have to jump two feet up over this rock to keep going on the trail. Wow. So that's when the hunter starts thinking like what did I sign up for myself? <laughs> <laughs> but they're amazing those horses like they we keep the trail wide enough for them so that like the pack boxes don't have any problems or anything but like they don't we've never had an issue of a horse like falling or anything because it's like he loses their footing like they are so nice to have out there because you're going through rivers that are sometimes up to their bellies and you're going through shale which are slippery and terrible and like wasp nests which are always exciting <laughs> but yeah like it's definitely and it's Sometimes exciting and sometimes a dull 10 hour ride, but by the end of the ride, everyone's figuring out how to lay on their horse like a trick rider and it's crazy, that's for sure. And then you roll into the cabin at nighttime. So it's like, who sometimes, like it depends how many trees are down and how much you have to like cut, that you roll in at dark typically. So maybe even the last hour of your ride, it's dark, you're trying to ride, but you have no clue, you can't see anything, the horses are doing it for you, and you're like, well, oh, okay. Hmm. And quite often on the way, you're running into bears. Like, when we went the last fall, I think we ran into three black bears on the whole trip, which wasn't too bad, but most of the time they just step off the way for you, but it's definitely, it's, those horses are pretty good horses. They figure it out, and they don't even react anymore to the bears as long as they're not coming at us or anything but they'll see them the one was 50 yards from us just kind of off the side a little bit and the horses just kept walking they didn't care anymore hmm. yeah wow. yeah that's that's so pretty, pretty cool Shelby that's like that's quite the quite the adventure and do you find that the um the hunters adapt pretty well for the most part by the time you hit yeah. your cabin or yeah oh yeah definitely you don't have to coach them how to get on and off the horse anymore like it's crazy what 10 hours of riding does to you pretty quick <laughs> and what's the level of experience that you usually see from these guys um for that particular hunt and that hunter I'm talking about, he never rode before in his life. Wow. That was the first time he was ever on a horse. So it was definitely like, you're going to be sore tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And then That's once you're out there, because um, I'm guessing you then use the horses to access some of the terrain that you're wanting to hunt in, or what does that look like? Do they kind of stay at the cabin? Um, are they coming with you every day? Um, so you'll definitely take horses with you every day, but nowhere near as many. So like the cook will stay home and care for the main portion of the herd. And then the guide, which was my husband and the hunter go out with maybe two or three horses. They'll take the two riding horses and maybe one pack horse in case they get something. So it's much easier, much less exciting. And then typically from the cabin, that particular cabin, you're only riding two hours in the morning to get to where you need to go. So it's much easier for them that way. And then the horses that stay at the main cabin that you're at, um, what you do is all night long when it's nice and cool and they can graze, you just put hobbles on all of them and they have free access to the river right there. 
and they have free access to a huge avalanche slide, which we put our cabin in. So they just graze all night long and they hang out and get everything they need. And then the day, once it starts getting the hotter in the day and you don't want them grazing so much, I'll go out and I'll catch them all and I'll tail tie them all together and lead them back down to the shade and tie them up in the shade until it cools off again. So they have a pretty chill life once they get out there. Nice. It's just that one main ride, yeah. So they'll probably be tied up in the day, probably until 10 till four, and I'll give them water breaks and stuff occasionally, like throughout the day. But yeah, they definitely, they learn to stand tied pretty good too. Wow. And do you, do you do much with the horses in the winter time? Like, do you ever get calls, guys wanting to go out for hunting in the winter, like in the snow? Not at all. Thank goodness. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like they kind of become a wild herd over the winter. We just put them out on a winter grazing lease and you go and you pick them up at about May. But yeah, so it's we typically the end of October is when you're finishing up your horseback hunts. Hmm. We were thinking about doing some horseback stuff in the winter because my husband he's very into hunting with his hounds with predators and cougars and stuff so he was thinking about getting the mule and saddling her up and giving her some nice like shoes for traction in the winter and taking her into the back country with the dogs but well we're not sure about that I think we'd need a couple mules to do that because the horses they just wouldn't be able to handle the terrain as much especially with them being such big horses because most of them have like size one size two shoes on their feet like they've got these big plates as feet basically mm -hmm. yeah it would be very tough for them mm -hmm. yeah and you mentioned earlier that this is um, an outfit that you kind of married into um it was your yeah you inherited to you through your husband's family. How, how long has it been in operation in your husband's side and how did it first come to be? Um, so they've owned it for nine years. And so Cody's dad, Daryl, he basically, he was a welder in the Elk Valley and he was making good money. And eventually he got sick of the four days on and four days off and He's always kind of been a bit of an entrepreneur, so he just started looking. He's like, I love hunting, let's do it for a living. So he started looking at places for sale around here, and the one that we have now is for sale and purchased it. <laughs> so it's like you just, to run and own an outfitting territory, you basically, you got to go take a little test to get your outfitter license, and then you can just purchase the territory and run it. Wow. So he quit his welding job and now we all do this full time. And what, and I mean, feel free to not give us all the information, but what is it like working with family? Um, you know what, it's really not too bad. I don't mind it. Yeah. Because it's like, we're kind of all a boss of our own. Like we kind of all handle what we're best at like Cody does most of the guiding and I do most of the horses and like nobody knows what no just kidding I'm not I'm not gonna slam Daryl <laughs> I'm gonna bug him a bit but <laughs> no he does a lot of the a lot of the guiding too he's slowing down a bit now he's kind of giving Cody most of the work but um he does he honestly he does a lot of the PR like a lot of the booking like you'll go and to meet your clients, you normally do big conventions and big shows in the state. And he does a lot of that where he'll meet the people and tell them what we do. And he'll do a lot of the book. And yeah. And then Joyce, which is Cody's mom, she does all the kind of the office work, the bookkeeping and all the important stuff that we wouldn't be here without. <laughs> and she is an amazing cook. I know this because I had. Oh. oh. Yes. Yeah, she's such a good cook. I don't know how you're not 600 pounds, Shelby, because the food up there <laughs> is so good. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's amazing. I remember when I was in school, I was a student, and everyone knows how students eat. 
I'd come here for the weekend and I would just like gorge myself. I think it was the only reason why I lived. It was coming here for the weekends and eating Joyce's food. <laughs> oh my God. So good. Oh, and I should tell like from someone who's been there, um, my perspective, like it was so cool. So you drive up all of these mountain roads past lots of um, lakes and, and I mean, there's fishing up there and there's rafting up there, and you guys do some other cool things too. Um, and then you get to your place, which mm -hmm. you drive in, and there's the big main cabin, and there is a few smaller cabins that the guests stay in, and then you've got mm -hmm. this, you look up above, and there's the hoodoos, which is really neat to see. Um, yeah. And you're right close to the river, and there's the your your house as well. Yeah. Um, and then in the middle, and it's beautiful, and you know there's I mean tree. I mean you're in nature, right? You're in the mountains, and in the middle there's a yeah. lovely like campfire spot. And in the mornings we'd all go into the main cabin and get delicious food cooked for us and then in the <laughs> evenings we would either do that or go and sit around this campfire and you were talking about how you're you know the horses kind of roam and you'd be sitting by the campfire and the horses would just come through the forest and walk up behind you and then disappear into the moonlit night it's a lovely lovely space <laughs> it's yeah special. it's pretty cool mm-hmm yeah. Until they eat your flowers out of your front garden because they're free ranging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck gardening. Not for the gardener. <laughs> yeah. No. We had a beautiful garden this year. It was funny. And they actually ate every single one of our beets, carrots, and peas. The little stinkers. No. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so, how yeah. many of these expeditions do you typically go on per year? It's definitely, it's basically you're wide open, you're hunting with like the horseback trips like that, wide open from September to the end of October. And you normally do not have a day off in between. Mm. Like we book it full all the way through. The only time you get a day off is if you kill an animal in the beginning of your hunt and you get to come out a few days early right then you'll have a few right. days off but yeah you're basically your average hunt is probably about nine days so you'll leave like august 31st to be out there for september 1st for your first day and you don't come back until the 9th or the 10th and the next day you're packing up to go again wow, wow. yeah what what are people usually hunting for? So I know we've got a lot of elk around. Like, is elk mostly yeah. what you're what people are looking for? Um, we have all access to big game animals in this area, so we can hunt any species with a big game animals here. But for the horseback trips, normally only do elk, just because of like the location of our cabins and the areas of the elk hunting like say if you're going up hunting for a goat it's the kind of terrain that you can't take horses in it's right. too steep it's yeah so you don't take horses on those ones but it's definitely like a lot of elk hunting is what you're doing for all your horseback trips and for people who um who don't know and actually i'd love you to speak to this so in Canada, because I know we've got a lot of listeners around the globe, um, in order to be able to hunt, you have to have like your your um, your pal, your core. Um, can you explain kind of the process and and um, yeah the 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 hoops? Could you could you give us the hoops, Shelby? <laughs> For sure. So. For a local resident to hunt, you need to pass a test which is called your hunting core. So it's typically like a weekend course and you'll take your core 
and it teaches you all about like the species and what's legal and how to understand um, firearms and it's a huge thing they stress in the course is ethics is like your ethics while you're hunting so like just because it's legal should you do it kind of thing because ethics is a huge thing for us because a lot of people are against hunting so we try to keep it as clean and as respectful as possible and then so it gets a little funny there so when you're under age you can hunt with just your core and a firearm but you're not allowed to legally own a firearm so you'll hunt with someone who's of age who can legally own a firearm and to legally own a firearm you're going to have to go and take your pal course which is a weekend course again and then so you'll take the course you pass the test and then you'll have to submit an application to the government to be able to still get one even if you pass the course because you're going to need to they do background checks on you they ask for references they call your friends and they check what your mental health is like if you have any records with people about issues or so like say if someone's going to a counselor and they have any red flags about your mental health you probably won't get your pal so it's very intense to get your pal and of course like every single day they're running the record so if any new red flags come up on your um your records your mental health your um background check for anything they'll pull your license and you can't legally own a firearm anymore so it's pretty rigorous which is awesome but yeah so you get your core and your pal and you can hunt legally as a local um but for us as outfitters like once we get our outfitting outfitting license we can take people that are non-residents or residents as well that don't have their hunting license or their pal and because we are licensed to guide them and we have all the certifications they don't have to so we just buy them a quick one-time license in the tag and as long as they're hunting with us and they stay like right beside us then they don't have to worry about that Inter interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, um, that that's how it worked for, like, if someone was coming from the U.S., let's say. Yeah. Like, right? Um, that that's yeah. how they, that's, that's how they did it. And then, um, oh, I had another question, but then when they get their meat, and if they're coming from out of the country, is it a whole process to get the meat ac back across the border? Is that something that, like, what's that like? It's different for every country and every species of animal. So oh, like, sometimes it can be quite complicated, yeah. But, like, for a uh, elk hunter who comes from the U.S., he can take all his meat no problem. We just fill out a permit for him that says he's harvested that animal, and it's just a transport permit, so he could transfer it to like where we're from and like fly home with the meat. Yeah, so that's pretty easy. You take it to the butcher and you get it, it's called flash froze. So they freeze it overnight for you and they store it in a bunch of insulated boxes and they'll fly it home with them. And most of the time they take all their meat, which is really nice, but also sucks for us because then we don't get to keep any meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like Australia, for example, they can't take any of their meat back. So they'll come and they'll get their trophy, their animal, and then for like, say if they get an elk, we'll just say again, do you have to, for like, if they want to get a full cape and get a full mount, they'll have to get a tanner to tan the whole cape for them and get like the skull bleached and everything so there's no animal byproducts anymore, and then they could send it home. And then that works out for us because then we get to keep all the meat and then we get to eat for the winter. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so like most of the species, yeah, we, we like the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it gets a little complicated. Like, say if they get a cougar, then it's a little more complicated to move the meat because you, then you have to apply to get a CITES permit, which sometimes can take a month to come in. So we'll have to have the meat frozen in our freezer holding on to them and then we, when we finally get the permit we can ship it to them. So then it gets a little more complicated. It's all over the place. There's a lot of rules you gotta follow with stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just dying to know, um, I've, I've 
feel like we've painted this beautiful picture of just where you are and kind of what you do. <laughs> um, do you have any stories that really stand out for you of doing this over the years of just um, like the hunts that have really stayed with you or the trips that have really stayed with you? Um, just dying to know, you know, some of those things that really bring bring this to life for people, just some of those stories. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure almost every hunt you have a good story about. You spend nine days 24-7 with the person, you definitely get some interesting pointers. Um, one hunter, he's been back with us a couple of times. He's a pretty funny guy. He came for a goat hunt last year. So they go up the mountain and they successfully got this goat and they were super excited about it. But unfortunately, the goat actually fell off the cliff after he was been shot. So to find the goat is always a job then when he falls off and you can't just get him where you shot him. So I think it was four days they spent looking for this goat and they thought he was stuck and hung up on a bluff. So one, our guide actually called a rock climber in the area to bring all his rock climbing gear so they could climb the mountain and look on this bluff to find this goat. And all they found was a little tuft of hair on that bluff. And the goat was actually a hundred yards behind them just on the hillside and it fell all the way down the mountain for them. Wow. So it was like they climbed up and down that mountain four times before they figured out it was just a little, little bit behind them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, there is always a good couple interesting stories. And because it was such a good hunter with such a good humor, like, it was just hilarious. Like, I remember one time he came down and he's like, the most funny thing happened on the mountain today, guys. He's like, I was finally thought I was figuring out how to climb your mountains because he comes from the prairies in the States. And he's like, so I'm crawling up the mountain. I'm all off fours and I'm just giving her and I'm super excited. And I'm like, hey, Chris, who was our guide. And he's like, look, I've got this. And like, our guide just looks at him and he's like, stand erect. <laughs> <laughs> just like no sympathy or anything because you just it with mountain climbing experience that is the best way to climb I mean you use the least energy and everything with the hunter was just like oh and he like stood straight up like a spring and he was like okay <laughs> oh that's funny so he was coming from the prairies going up an incline and just like on all yeah. fours when he really he yeah needed to stand up and walk like <laughs> yeah exactly that's pretty funny. yeah it's definitely oh it's hilarious some of the times some of the things they say sometimes you're just like this is awesome I love this <laughs> yeah that's great um oh you taught yeah. me something when I was up there um you mentioned going through like wasps and bee nests and whatever earlier on in our conversation today mm -hmm. and um was it you or uh I can't remember I think it was you joking about how the first person to go through uh is usually fine <laughs> it's the person behind you who yeah. <laughs> gets hit <laughs> yeah <laughs> and <laughs> yeah exactly that's what always seems to happen and it's always the guide that goes first because yeah. if he sees an animal he needs to stop everyone and shut down so cody my yeah. husband goes through first and he never gets stung of course and then it's always the hunter that goes next so he'll maybe get one or two his horses normally get hit more than anything and then i'm always the last because i'm normally the cook and the wrangler so i deal with the horses and the problems <laughs> And you can, by the time you even start getting close, you can hear the buzz and you're just like, oh no. So most of the time people just crash through it. Like that's all the stories you get is you just kind of like give the horse's head and let them run through it. And you always have all your pack horses in the back bronking off all their boxes and it's just a rodeo. <laughs> but I decided that I don't want to deal with that anymore. So I normally just like stop and wait and I'll sit there for 10 minutes if I have to until I can hear all the wasps finally go back into their nest 
and then I'll go put her through because I probably have four horses tied behind me as well as my horse. So then by the time I'm all the way through, like I'm normally good and it's just my back horse, you can hear jacking around and you're like, sorry, buddy. <laughs> it could have been way worse. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely interesting. But I always stop and wait now because it's not fun getting stung. <laughs> I like that we were all just, we were waiting to give each other a turn there, Mira. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Late. <sighs> well, um, so we've heard about wasps and we've, we've described some pretty cool stories. I can only imagine what the rock climber thought. That's great. Um, <laughs> Um, I wanted to bring up something else really cool, uh, at least I think it's so cool. So you have a little girl, how old is she? She's seven and a half months old now. Seven and a half months old, and um, she has already been on many adventures, um, and she's <laughs> yep. been on horseback. Um, I, yep. saw, I saw a picture of... Um, of her looking up at a cougar in a tree not long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. what is, um, what kind of adventures has she been on? She's obviously going to be a horse girl. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's definitely been on a lot. It was, so she was born in late March. So I think it was late May. So she was two months old when we killed my bear with her. So we had her stuffed in Cody's backpack and we like saw this bear in the cut block and we spotted him. So we got out and we hiked up in there to go and get him. And we got within probably 40 yards of him. And of course, as soon as we see him, she starts waking up in the backpack and you start hearing her fuss. So it was like, it was within like two seconds of her starting to cry. I ended up shooting the bear because I was like, oh, out of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> hope this is a good shot. But yeah, so she was two months old when she was on her first successful hunt. And I think it was that, that spring she did. Um, so there was three successful hunts she was on for bears. And then she's been on that cougar hunt that we took her on. That was exciting. Mm -hmm. And even the summer we went for a hike. It was a seven hour hike total. And we just put her in a little carrier and strapped her to the back of Cody's backpack and she went on the seven hour hike. Yeah, she's she's a little trooper already. Pretty and awesome. does she come with you on most of the expeditions that you do now? Yep, almost all of them now. So it's definitely like, it's getting a little more interesting now that she doesn't like sitting still so much but no she comes with us almost everything like quad rides like if we're on a cut trail or it's pretty funny you're whipping out your little baby on the quad and doing diaper changes <laughs> I'm sure it looks humorous to a lot of people <laughs> it was like when we were going to chase the cat so like we're getting out of the truck and we're getting all geared up and putting her in the backpack so she's got this bright pink coat and we're all in camo and there's these other hunters that drive by and you just see them, they like smile and wave and then they see Elizabeth stuffed in the backpack and they're just like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and we're like, hey, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. it's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, and has she, has she been on the back of a horse yet? Yeah, yeah, quite often. We did a fair bit of trail riding with her this summer. I don't so much ride with her when I'm alone because I always seem to ride the colts or the stupid ones and I don't won't trust them enough to take her with me. But like anytime Cody comes with me or my in-laws come with me or anything, then they always have her strapped on because they ride those good old steady horses that don't do anything wrong. She loves it. She thinks it's awesome because you're always moving. You can always see the trees. So she just sits there and giggles most of the time. Aw, what a cool upbringing. What a wonderful adventures to be able to tell her about when she's older. 
Mm -hmm. We keep joking that when she finally goes to school, she's going to be like, what do you mean you don't have a river and hoodoos in your yard? <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Um, hey, and I also met, speaking of other cool things and young horses that jogged my mind, um, so I met one of the horses that you started and is now sold. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and 30 days or 60 days of training up where you are is pretty special compared to where a lot of other horses get their training. So you put mm -hmm. your young horses, the horses you're, you have in training, um, they get a lot of miles. Oh yeah. Yeah. They get a lot of miles before I even think about putting like a riding saddle on them. Like for Moose, the one you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we got him and he was, he has had some exposure, like he knew how to lunge and he's had a saddle on, but he just wasn't mentally ready to start riding yet. So the first thing we did with him is we put a pack saddle on him and we took him on that 10 hour trip. And I think he did three of those trips before I even started working with him about like getting on his back and doing things. Oh. Like, so that's, I think it's, to just over 20 kilometers in and 20 kilometers out so he almost put on 100 kilometers just on the trail with other horses before we even thought about riding him and that's the rivers and the wasps and the shale so they definitely they figure out how to be a good horse on the trail before we worry about getting on them they figure out how to use their brains a little bit more I'm not like you're definitely cranking out some sure-footed mountain ponies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're pretty trustworthy after that, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Makes it a lot nicer on your first ride, though, because they're more worried about, like, they're not so concerned about you being on their back, especially after having the pack saddle, which is way bigger and more intrusive. And they already know how to keep their feet under themselves, especially when you start trail riding. So it just makes it much more of a nice experience for them that first couple of rides. Nice. Um, yeah. Do you find um, that a lot of the horses, you mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll keep them as part of your pack string. Sometimes you'll um, move them on to new homes if they're looking like they have a little bit more potential. Um, do you find that that kind of sure-footedness stays with them in their travels wherever they end up um, going? Definitely. Definitely. It's definitely, I notice a huge difference, like, for the one I'm working with now, he's a Mustang, actually, so he's pretty sure-footed as it is, but I've definitely noticed it's really nice when you go to work with him and say if it's a bit muddier in my round pen, when you ask him to speed up a little bit, you'll tell it's like a much more controlled, focused trot or something like that. Like he intentionally slows himself down because of that, because he knows to keep his feet under himself and that it's not such secure footing. And I'm like, I think that's awesome. It definitely makes a difference. Like, especially like we had one horse that we sold three years ago now he was a Clyde Cross and he went into jumping mm. and it was like he would take care of his rider and he was so much more secure going over the jumps and he wouldn't do it if he wasn't sure about the footing so I think it makes a huge difference in your own safety and theirs as well. I like that yeah, that's developing those stopping systems those um their proprioception gets developed, their joint stability gets developed. That's, that's mm -hmm. really neat. Um, Mira, you were going to say mm -hmm. something. I interrupted you. Oh, I was just going to say it's such a different beginning than what a lot of horses in kind of the more kind of equine sport world um, would experience mm -hmm. and neat to kind of hear you talk about how you see that um, translating for them into some of the more kind of quote-unquote traditional um, equine sports where um, mm -hmm. you're seeing that sure-footedness tra like translate into how they're approaching jumps later on and because I think you know we um, as as equine enthusi enthusiasts we we always want to foster that in our horses so that there's that partnership of making those decisions together and hearing you speak mm -hmm. about that is really inspiring. Yeah. Makes me want to hit yeah, the trail. Yeah, it's 
<laughs> yeah, I love trail riding. I definitely, I like it for, I had my own little kind of performance mare for a while and I loved it. I loved even just seeing how her brain changes from the trail to the arena because we spent the full summer in BC starting her and doing trail riding and just seeing the brain development from that. And then we took her all winter to the arena to Olds to ride at school. And it was like, it was kind of cool because she was like, she had a different horse at school. It was like, she was more, not so much flighty, but she was definitely like more high strung being constantly in the arena and in the barn and like a little more worried versus in the mountains. It was kind of like, even though you're still coming into crazy things like really slippery mud and like really worrisome things for a horse like she's it was just a totally different horse like how the terrain and being outdoors changed her brain mm -hmm. like I'm a huge supporter of even if you have a performance horse you can still get out and trail ride and give them that brain break to relax again and it sounds like really important brain development time too like I think we often think about um, getting out of the arena as that kind of ah daydream time and being able to just kind of unwind a little bit but um neat kind mm -hmm. of hearing all of the positives that are still happening even on that casual trail ride in terms of um, our horse's development and how that's going to translate later on mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely and it makes good kid horses to the trail rides we actually we have one retiree that we're sending out for the kids home hopefully we'll see but it's like it's nice because they're like a little too sore for her to do a 10 hour pack trip with all the weight anymore but they make awesome five-year-old horses like kids five-year-olds for just to be packed around on a lead line in the backyard or on short little trails like there i've never had better horses for stuff like that because they've been through everything of all the craziness and the wasp nests and so they don't jack around so much anymore they're just like well this is way easier than what it was we'll just <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> well, and yeah. how lovely for that child too because i i know we all want to foster that love for horses and all those good experiences too versus um falling mm -hmm. in love with a horse that's a little bit more green and having some of those negative experiences so how lovely for those yep. kids too yeah exactly yeah um i was going to ask you so uh if, if someone was interested or or someone is thinking about say contacting you guys um to go out on a trip uh what would you like them to be prepared how would you like them to be prepared for you um a lot of the time like we like we don't stress a whole lot like physical fitness like you don't have to be able to run a marathon or anything but we definitely do let them know like it's like sitting on a horse isn't like riding a quad or a side by side like you got to be capable enough to get in and out of the saddle on your own and capable enough to have be able to sit in the saddle for 10 hours because that hurts like I ride all the time in 10 hours I am sore so we definitely like let them know like sometimes you have people we had one guy who was in a wheelchair inquiring about a horse trip back trip one time and we're like yeah uh -huh. we don't know like I don't think that's gonna work like he wasn't paralyzed but we're just like so it's basically like you have to be not in shape but you have to be physically capable that we worry about and then a lot the main thing we really worry about is the gear like you got to have good gear like don't show up with rubber boots and jeans like you want to be you have want to have good rain gear you want to have good hiking boots and good riding boots because otherwise it's just it's no fun you get fried you get exhausted it's cold it's miserable so we have a very extreme gear list. We always send all our hunters before they come here. Nice, good, good thinking. Uh, do you get mm -hmm. people who are underprepared, or is are the are most often things pretty easy for you guys? Uh, we definitely get some people underprepared. Um, the other year we had another goat hunter come in. And, like, he was an awesome guy. He was in great physical shape. He seemed pretty ready. 
And then he pulled out his backpack, which was kind of like one of those nice box coolers with just a shoulder strap for over his back, for his backpack. Oh, no. And we're like, you're going to hike a BC mountain with a cooler for your backpack. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, we definitely have some people that don't quite understand the gear list, but I mean, we can tell them and we do have spare gear, of course, because it definitely, it's not fun hiking stuff with hiking those mountains of stuff you're not prepared for. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like I've learned so much <laughs> in this conversation, just all the ins and outs and the intricacies of running an operation like this. Um, was there mm -hmm. anything that we didn't touch on in our conversation that you wanted to make sure that we covered today? Um, nothing super huge. Maybe just like one thing when you're riding in the wild with all the animals, like everyone always thinks like bears and like predators are the scariest thing to come up on, mm. but definitely not. I think the worst animal to come across when you're riding is a moose, a hundred percent. Like we ran into bears and grizzly bears. Grizzly bears aren't always super fun, but the horses know what they're going to do. But moose are just so unpredictable and they're so much bigger than the horse. And they are so aggressive. It is not fun. Like we'll get in even within like 200 yards you can see them at the top of the slide and every single one of our horses jack around. Hmm. Like they just know yeah. that moose are scary because <laughs> we've been charged by them a few times and it's just like it's a rodeo. Every single time you run into a moose it's never ever fun. That's a good point to bring up for our international listeners, too, because they're all always like, oh, no, all the bears in Canada, right? Um, yeah. Really, it's the moose you got to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, if we see black bears, we're like, oh, yeah, that's nice. Take a picture. Keep going. Yeah, it's the moose. <laughs> yeah. You watch have, out. Hold I on. Have, <laughs> I had a friend um, in high school who n um, narrowly escaped death by moose. He got... Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, since that experience, I'm always like, okay, yeah, got to watch out for those guys because you never know if they're going to be chill with you or if you're going to have to run. And they keep running. They're very, usually very dedicated. Yeah. Yeah, they don't, they'll literally go for like 10 kilometers straight on the trail and they don't ever gump, jump off. And you're just like, why won't this stop? <laughs> yeah, they're not nice. And they keep coming back. Even if they do leave, they'll come back at you again. Interesting. Yeah, like most. No. Yeah. I'm curious, do you find it's the same with elk or are elk a totally different ballgame? Elk are like another horse on the trail. Nobody cares about them. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the horses don't seem to care about them. The elk will normally just step off the trail. Same thing with like mule deer and white tail. They'll normally just step off. Just seems to be moose. And it's funny too, because like say if we have a moose hunter and we harvest a moose and we have to put the moose on the horse, it's the same situation. It's like they can smell it. The horse always jacks around and is a doe head when you're trying to put the moose onto the horse in the pack boxes and everything. It's weird. Do you mm -hmm. find you have to do any kind of desensitizing work with the horses in terms of loading them with meat? Um, not so much actually. It's mainly just desensitizing before you even start packing. Like if it's like elk meat and stuff, most of the time they don't care or fuss or anything. It just seems to be moose. <laughs> yeah, they're, it's weird. Yeah. They're, they're special, those moose. Have you been, yeah. have you been seriously chased by a moose before? Like, have you not had super seriously? Out? We've definitely had them like run at us, but not like a super serious charge where they crash through your herd. But we definitely know outfitters who have had to shoot and kill a moose because they were like worried for their life because wow. it just kept coming back and kept coming back and it's like well you can't risk everything all your horses are bucking you're up 
clients over there hiding under a tree. So it's like, well, okay, got to do it. Yeah, thankfully we haven't had to do that, which is nice, but we've definitely had a couple give us a little run and we're like, uh-oh, please don't. <laughs> So, yeah. Shelby, if anyone wants to um, find you guys and contact you and give you their business, how the heck do they do that? Um, well, for our outfitting portion, we do have a website and we also have Facebook for White Swan Lake Outfitters. And then more of our tourism aspect, we're on Airbnb in the Canal Flats area and we also have a Facebook for Airbnb and it's called um, White River Adventures instead. So basically you could probably find us on almost any platform between internet and Facebook and Instagram and look up either of those and we're on there. Awesome, okay. Awesome. Mira, did you have any last questions for Shelby or? No, I think that's everything. Um, I feel like we covered so much and I'm just itching to get out on a trail right now with my horse. <laughs> I feel like I've been really <laughs> tired. <laughs> yeah, that was so much fun, Shelby. Um, any last words? Um, thank you guys. Thanks so much. That was awesome. <laughs> Aw, that was so much fun. Um, well, in that case, Mira, is that a wrap? I think that's a wrap. If you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>